All right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Tara Moore, and I'm the Director of Conservation Partnerships for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. I'm just letting some folks in um, as we're starting up here. If everyone just wants to go ahead and mute their lines as they join on, that will be perfect. If you're not able to figure that out, there is the mute button in the top right hand corner of the screen. It looks like a microphone, so you can just click that to mute. You are allowed to be on video or you can go off if you'd prefer. That's completely up to you. Um, and if you have any issues with muting or anything like that, you can send me an email. I just sent an email a few minutes ago so you guys can answer to that and I can definitely help you with that. So. Thank you for joining on the Wildlife Connectivity in North Carolina call. And we have a great group of speakers today. These three are rock stars at everything that they do. So I'm excited to hear from them. Um, just wanted to give you a little update on the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And we were formed in 1945 and we protect, conserve and uh, restore wildlife and habitat in the state. And we do this for species from the monarch butterfly up to bear and elk, um, some species that we'll be covering today. So we work across the whole state. We have a chapter network. We do policy, education work, and conservation projects on the ground. So I'm super excited that you're all joining us here today. We have a great crowd. Um, if anyone has questions during the call, um, the chat feature is not going to be um, able to be used. So you can actually, there's a little hand at the top right hand corner. It says raise hand. So you can click on that. It'll raise your hand. And once our three speakers are done sharing, um, we'll be able to call on you all and you'll be able to unmute yourselves and ask the question. So we're looking forward to hearing some great questions because um, there's some great, great information that they'll be sharing here. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz Rutledge, Dr. Dr. Liz, Liz Dr. Rutledge, Dr. and I will go ahead and get us running here with our topic. Thanks, Liz. All right, thanks, Tara. Um, so first of all, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Liz Rutledge, the Director of Wildlife Resources at the Wildlife Federation. Um, so I'd start, I'd like to start out with a little background on how the partnership with today's great speakers was formed. Um, vehicle wildlife collisions are a growing concern in our state as human populations grow. Um, we then expand transportation networks to accommodate these needs. Um, unfortunately, that puts wildlife species in danger and they can sometimes face the threat of mortality on roadways on a daily basis. Um, and this is also a human con safety concern um, for us as well. So. A few years back, the Wildlife Federation partnered with Wildlands Network and National Parks Conservation Association on a joint effort to collar and monitor the movement of elk in Western North Carolina and to use what we call camera traps to determine when and where various wildlife species cross roadways and to determine solutions for this issue. Um, so today we're very excited to have Dr. Liz Hillard and Steve Goodman with us to discuss animal movements, habitat connectivity, and the benefit of highway crossing structures for wildlife. Um, as our last speaker today, I'll briefly discuss the Wildlife Federation's role in advocating for safe passage of wildlife in the state, and I'll talk a little bit about how some of our work relates to this effort. Um, so first of all, we are going to have Dr. Liz Hillard up and she is a wildlife scientist for Wildlands Network. She earned her PhD at Southern Illinois studying how the alteration and fragmentation of bottomland hardwood forests influence um, the swamp rabbit. Liz earned a master's degree in biology at Western Carolina where her research focused on understanding habitat selection of reintroduced elk in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And at Wildlands Network, Liz directs and manages the Pigeon River Gorge Connectivity Project and engages in habitat connectivity, road ecology, and conservation efforts throughout the Southern Appala Appalachian region. And then second, we'll have Steve Goodman, who is currently a research, a wildlife research fellow with National Parks Conservation Association in Asheville. Uh, he currently co-leads a wildlife connectivity research project in the Pigeon River Gorge in North Carolina and Tennessee, which we will hear about today. 
Uh, Steve holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a second one in finance from the University of South Florida, and he has a master's degree in biology from the University of West Florida. Prior to joining National Parks Conservation Association in 2018, Steve worked for Virginia Tech for a decade at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, eight years for Arizona Game and, and Fish Department and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. With 20 years of experience researching, monitoring, and managing sensitive wildlife and habitats, his objective is to find the balance between the need for novel research and using existing best available information to make decisions to conserve wildlife and landscapes. Um, and then finally, I'll be your third speaker today. I'm from Western North Carolina. I received my bachelor's degree in biology from Wingate University and an MS and PhD in natural resources and fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology from NC State. Uh, some past research experience includes oxen and tree growth, mammal trapping, disease surveys, um, and then I did my PhD monitoring resident Canada goose movements to reduce the risk of collisions with aircraft at suburban airports. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hillard. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Liz. Thanks, Tara. And thanks everybody for joining in. First things first, I better get this shared here. Is that everybody can see that? Yes. And I'm advancing my slides all right here. You are. That looks great. OK. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all. So Steve and I are kind of splitting this up today. Um, so we're we're kind of the co-leads here on the research on the ground outside of Gro Great Smoky Mountain National Park along Interstate 40. This research we're using uh, to guide road mitigation and restore wildlife connectivity, like Liz said, near Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I want to acknowledge my boss, uh, Dr. Ron Sutherland, and also Jeff Hunter. And as Liz was saying, um, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation had a big part in getting this research started and on the ground. So real quick, and Liz kind of mentioned this, we know that habitat fragmentation is one of the leading threats to biodiversity and the conservation of our wildlife species, and that really roads are the leading cause of this habitat fragmentation. Uh, our wildlife species, big and small, all need different resources, different food resources, and need to be able to move in space to find those, as well as mates. And so these roadways create can create barriers for some wildlife or even really reduce movement. And this barrier effect can create these isolated populations. Uh, without this genetic exchange and these resources, we have these depleted populations, and then they're more susceptible to localized extinction events. Uh, when we consider the climate crisis we're going through now and knowing that wildlife is going to be moving northward, we see that it's imperative that we start trying to figure out solutions for wildlife. And so while this can create these isolated populations, uh, impact movements to find resources, but we also see this additive mortality. I think a lot of folks these days can see wildlife um, along the roadway. And so this is impacting our wildlife populations as well. But what's exciting is, and I'm sure a lot of folks have been seeing, um, especially on social media, these new solutions. Um, this, this picture here is taken in Banff. Uh, in Canada, where they've really kind of been leading on these over wildlife overpass or underpass structures. But we know that these are really great ways to help create safe passage for wildlife along roadways. We also have, you know, along roadways, we do have these structures, right? Vehicle underpasses, bridges that span um, creeks and riparian areas, um, and culverts to move water that also sometimes can pass wildlife, and Steve's gonna get into that a little more, but even modifying those structures. And also things like incorporating fencing uh, to funnel animals to these places. They can't seem to just randomly find these, so they need to be helped guided to those areas for safe passage. And so we see this increase in road ecology research, understanding how um, wildlife interact with the roadway, and that's really um, what we're focused on in the Pigeon River Gorge. So bringing it into our study area here, so we are focused on this area um, outside of Great Smoky Mountain National Park. If you look at this inset map, um, 
Great Smoky Mountains is here in the blue. Um, and we have large public lands, Pisgah and Cherokee National Forest, to the, to the northeast. And so I'm not sure how many folks have driven this roadway. Um, our study area is 28 miles here, spanning both North Carolina and Tennessee. And so this, this part, portion of the interstate, it, it winds through the mountains here. We often see large um, concrete barriers, both in the center lane and on the sides of the road. This roadway was built uh, in the 1950s, 60s. It was really built up. Uh, it's been interesting working along it. Uh, it almost uh, provides a bit of a wall, but there are these current structures that exist there. And we're, we're really focused and think this is one of the most important opportunities in the East and in North Carolina specifically to mitigate roadway effects. We have this great biological diversity in this region. Um, beyond just the small and the larger mammals we'll be talking about today, but you know, it's a salamander biodiversity hotspot. And um, so we're focused here because this large, important um, protected lands, we want animals to be able to move freely. What we're focused on in our research are due to their severity, but also these larger mammals are easier to detect in our road mortality surveys, on our cameras and to put GPS collars on, we are really focusing in on elk, bear, and white-tailed deer. And so this is a collaborative effort, um, and we'll both be mentioning that here and there, um, other organizations helping us with this research, but we really want to alleviate these roadway barrier effects, restore connectivity, and protect wildlife and human safety. So our research goal, I'm going to get kind of technical here and go through all of our pieces. I think Liz may be um, frozen for a second. Is anyone else seeing that on their screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll just give her just, just a second um, to come right back in. She'll probably just have to sign out and come back in. Thank you all for your patience. Okay, um, it looks like Liz may be having some issues with the connection. Oh, actually, she's coming right back in right now. Let's let's see if this goes, this works for her. Oh, I'm back. Hey, Liz. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Don't even worry. That okay. happens all the time with the internet. Let's get back to it. If I can find my, where's my screen now? It's the struggles of working from home, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is my is my screen still shared? Your screen is not shared currently. Okay, okay. Hang in there. Thanks for your patience, everyone. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Okay, that looks perfect, Liz. Hey. Thank you. I think I, I, I left off here and I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. I can be kind of redundant here. So um, so our research goal is to provide this framework that identifies these areas where we can focus um, these mitigation efforts. Um, and so I'm going to be focused in on this first objective. Steve gets to cover the next three, um, but they're all pretty exciting. So we have been using elk GPS. We have put elk G GPS collars on elk to identify and predict elk road crossing locations. So I'm gonna be focused in on that. 
But we are also identifying locations with high incidence of wildlife road mortality through weekly driving surveys and through data sharing with both the Tennessee and North Carolina departments of transportation. Um, we're also evaluating existing levels of road permeability, how or if wildlife are using these existing structures I was talking about. And um, we're also pairing kind of our road mortality surveys with cameras along the roadway so we can compare and see where we have not just animals getting hit by vehicles, but where we're seeing increased activity along the road. So let's talk about the It looks like Liz may be frozen again. I'm not sure if Steve, if you want to pick up um, maybe on your slides. I'm not sure if she's almost through her slides. I I think she's about she's only halfway done. Um, gotcha. So okay. I, mine takes about 14 minutes. I don't you know, I'm happy to, you know, jump in. If if needed, or uh, we can wait for her. Great. Yeah, I I think we will wait um, just just a minute to see if she gets back in, if that's OK with everyone. And then we'll move forward from there and come up with a plan. Sounds great. And this is Liz R. We factored in a few additional minutes for this, so we'll we'll work around it. But thank you guys for being patient with the uh, technology glitch. Yeah, Tara, our, our uh, presentations are, are separate, uh, but complementary. Uh, but okay. that makes me think we should have just one just in case this happens, right? <laughs> so we can uh, jump, uh, hand it off to each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely tough to know. This doesn't happen a lot, but if the connection's just being a little shoddy, then this, this can definitely happen. So let's see. Let's see if Liz is getting back on. We will work through it either way. We'll figure it out. And Asheville is notorious. Any little bit of wind. Uh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. We seem to lose power and connection more, okay. more, more than we should probably. Yeah, that's that's definitely frustrating, especially when you're on a call with people. <laughs> I I can I can appreciate how how frustrating that must be. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience as we work through these tech issues. And Tara, if you want me to just kind of intersperse the NCWF stuff that I was going to cover at the end, I can do that for a few minutes. Stop when Liz gets back. You know back. what? Maybe that would be great, Liz, if, if you want to share some of your thoughts now and then we can hop back over to it after Steve speaks. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and go for now because right. um, so what Steve and Liz are covering for us today is more of the biological, the on the ground work and the Wildlife Federation is covering a lot of more of an advocacy role with um, the collaborative group. So the collaborative is actually um, a large number of conservation groups, the state wildlife agency. We've got a lot of folks that are involved in this and so our work is to kind of come in as an advocate for funding, um, things like that. So habitat connectivity is a very high priority for the Wildlife Federation right now. And um, for some of the reasons that Liz was explaining, and I'm sure Steve will talk about too, we have wildlife mortality on roadways, but we also have issues with species not being able to reach um, areas that they need for their essential resources to fulfill their biological um, processes, um, whether that's throughout the day or the year, they need to be able to move for these different needs. Um, and so for the Federation, that's a priority. And so we want to um, support safe passage for animals. Um, so anything we do and we advocate for some of these modifications um, to roadways and transportation networks not only support large mammals, but they also support smaller species that are crossing roadways. And so um, that's something we're going to continue to advocate for, um, for wildlife crossings. And a lot of these are 
specifically, they cost a lot to implement. And that's something that um, Liz may get to in some of her talk. But so we are going to continue to support national transportation bills that include funding for overpasses, underpasses, and wildlife connectivity in general. Um, and so there's the corridors bill, things like that, which the Wildlife Federation can advocate for. And so we're also going to do that on a state level. We're going to continue to advocate for uh, protecting wildlife and roadways and coming up with collaborative solutions for these issues. Um, we're also going to continue our partnerships. We've got some limited work going on now with the State Wildlife Agency and with North Carolina DOT. And so we're going to continue to be part of the Pigeon River Gorge Crossing Collaborative in the western part of the state. And then we've also got some work that we're doing in the eastern part of the state with DOT and the State Wildlife Agency. We've had some of our volunteers out working to build up a chapter around Columbia, North Carolina for an effort to get out and monitor the wildlife underpasses on Highway 64. And so some of that is actually taking data and evaluating what species are actually utilizing the underpasses, uh, time of day, kind of the general, what's happening with that and what's utilizing it. Um, so that's one mechanism that was put in years ago for wildlife to go directly under the highway. And so our folks as part of that chapter network are gonna be able to monitor some of the fencing that supports that crossing. Um, they're gonna be looking for any kind of damage, things like that that occur so they can be repaired so that the wildlife continue to utilize the, the underpasses. And um, so that's a pretty neat project that we've been partnering on with the commission and UNCW to collect and analyze that data. So we'll have more on that in the future. And um, so basically, we're looking at continuing to build public support across the state. Um, we're talking about elk, black bear, white-tailed deer today, but this is an issue that is across an array of species. Um, so this is something we're going to continue to be involved in. So let's see. Okay, do we have Liz back? We do have Liz back. Yeah, okay. and thanks I'll for turn picking it up there, Liz. Liz. Yeah, um, we'll go from Liz to Liz. <laughs> I'm uh, quite nervous to start again. This is going to take me all day to get through this. Um, yeah, it, it is actually an internet issue, so um, I should sh try sharing my screen again. We'll see what... Thanks, this Liz. is the first time this has happened to me. Um, it looks perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm, I do have quite a few slides, so I need to kind of get moving here. So... Um, I'm trying to figure out where I left off. So, so elk and and one of the epicenters for the elk is you know um, Cataluchi Valley, and this is only about six kilometers from I-40. So again, we we have these GPS collars. I'm going to kind of just jump to that. So we have uh, 11 GPS collars that we've put out on 13 elk. Um, these are Iridium satellite communicating uh, GPS collars. So we're able to get one hour locations on the elk, and then we are able to use a virtual fence along the roadway, both I-40 and uh, Highway 19 to get more detailed information. We get 20 minute locations there. Uh, like I said, we've deployed 11 colors on 13 elk, and we started doing this in uh, March of 2018, and we're completing that this month. We only have one collar out, but to date, uh, almost about 115,000 elk locations. And with the help from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, we're able to enter in a data sharing agreement with the state um, to use their elk locations as well. Uh, here's some pictures. This has been being involved in wildlife for a significant portion of my life and getting to work with all kinds of critters. Steve and I getting to go out and this is where the collaborative and partnership uh, comes in both the uh, National Park biologists and the North Carolina um, Resource Commission biologists are who helped us get these collars out. So we've been working in close partnership with them to put out our elk GPS collars and um, what an experience uh, to get up close and personal with these large animals. I'm worried this is going to really break the 
the bank here, but uh, hopefully I can get this. Here's a video. Um, if I can get it moving, I have a still shot next. If I can't, having all kinds of technical difficulties. But this is showing the movement of elk in, in real time for about a year. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to this slide here. We see that elk movement is pretty individualistic. Um, again, we don't have these large migrating herds of elk out west. They tend to be in small groups, and then we see different seasonal movements. We'll see young bulls uh, usually making large dispersal movements, kind of explore what seem exploratory. But then if you notice here, Interstate 40 is in the yellow, and that animal in red, we call her our I-40 cow. Um, year after year, uh, Towards the end of uh, the beginning of the summer, when she's going to calve, she takes off and crosses the interstate um, to have her calf on the other side of the interstate. And we also have a couple um, animals that you see almost showing kind of a, the barrier effect here, where they're using um, the area right near the road, but they're not actually crossing it. So just kind of showing a spread of where we have these animals moving. We had an animal in Kowi. It's a diversity of movements. Um, they're not all together, and we're, we're still learning more about this. And so just to focus in on the on I-40 and the gorge, uh, again, Steve's going to be talking about the cameras and some mortality, but we see our in purple here our I-40 cow. And we've also detected elk, and she brought successfully brought back a calf. And if you notice these two pictures, uh, the first two pictures here um, are showing animals using what we're talking about, these these um, vehicle underpasses. So this is a bridge. This is actually where the Appalachian Trail crosses and our collared elk um, has successfully brought her calves back um, and back to the valley. And we also see in some of these larger spanning bridges over um, the river, that's also where we're seeing some elk. Um, so we also, uh, in this two year study area, did have an elk mortality noted by this um, red cross here um, in the gorge as well. And so as this population grows, it's still small and slow growing, but we imagine the interstate's going to be, you know, a major factor in both mortality and really well, uh, the elk being able to move. Um, some fun stories and talking about this elk um, bringing her calf back. We were able to get a collar on him, kind of wanting to, interested in a, a young bull, interested in if if these animals make these movements across the road, do we see other animals doing that as well? And with this young calf thinking he might follow in her um, path, but he's kind of stayed central to the uh, the Cataluchi um, Valley. So didn't see that movement. And while her collar is off, we still believe we're seeing her in our camera photos making these you know repeated movements every summer to calve across the interstate. And, and more exciting, another vehicle underpass and in our data sharing agreement with the Wildlife Resource Commission, um, Justin McVeigh, we detected, um, again, Steve's gonna go over these structure cameras, but uh, this young bull using one of these vehicle underpasses and Justin McVeigh shared the track of this animal. And we really see these young bulls, this animal at one point went into South Carolina, was in the Etowah area and is now in Tennessee. So some large movements, but again, individualistic. And so we really want to understand what, what, um, what's really influencing these elk movements. We know elk are a path of least resistance movers. We have a lot of topography out here. And we know the elk are going to kind of use the landscape to move through it, you know, least cost uh, to their energy reserves. So we're not going to see them scaling large mountains. So they're potentially capable, but they're going to follow maybe these riparian corridors. They follow, they do follow roadways. It's a pretty easy way to walk. And so, and also they're going to avoid really dense vegetation that's hard to move through. Uh, and we know that, you know, they're really um, focusing in on grasses. So we think that that kind of drives their movement as well. Uh, and we're going to be able to get into all of this while uh, what I've showed here um, allows us to see where they're moving and locations along the roadway. Uh, we're going to do some real science in here. We can really extract some parameters from understanding how quickly elk are moving from this location to the other. And even their turn angle, we can extract some of that information and then also um, use some landscape analysis with geographic information systems to look at how does slope or how does grass cover 
impact how elk are moving through the landscape and do some of this predictive modeling um, to look at these patterns and processes and then how that plays out on the landscape. Um, didn't want to get into the weeds there, but we're able to use then those predictors of how elk move through the landscape to construct these resistance surfaces. And that really is going to help us identify these locations of where elk are most likely to cross. We, we can identify where they're crossing now, but uh, based on how they're moving, we can pinpoint, uh, as in this map on the right in the blue, uh, really where we're going to see as the elk population moves, where we can uh, expect them to be crossing, and that's where we can focus our, our efforts. Um, so again, our future goals, identify locations for road mitigation, uh, those wildlife overpasses, where we can put in fencing, how we can improve these existing structures. There are five structures within this 28 mile study area in North Carolina that are slated to be replaced. And we're currently working with the North Carolina DOT. Uh, as Liz was saying, uh, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation as well to give input on how could these, as they're being replaced, be improved for wildlife um, to safely cross. And so we're really making some headway there. We're going to have a better understanding of how elk are moving through the landscape to help us provide that connectivity for these animals. And I think overall, uh, as a non-government organization, we really have these unique opportunities to uh, put together these partnerships and work with multiple folks and kind of fill in that gap um, to provide, you know, overall better understanding, but really to push these efforts forward. And, you know, with that, I didn't, limited time here, I feel like with falling out, but we've had so much collaboration on this project. Um, and so just thanking a, all of our partners and it, it is truly a collaborative effort. It's, we've seen a lot of success. We do have, we are talking to the departments of transportation, the state agencies, and and this really appears to be moving forward. Um, and so there's gonna be more on this to come. Again, we've, we're two years in, we're just wrapping up our research now. And so we'll have more to present in the future, but um, it looks really positive for us to be affecting and having real change out here in the gorge. Um, if uh, I have my information here, if folks want to follow up with me in email and with at Wildlands Network, I, you know, we really are focused on large landscape connectivity. We're throughout North America and in um, Mexico and in the states. We have other road ecology projects, I-10 in New Mexico, We're getting ready to start a project on I-80 in California and Highway 2 in Mexico. But we also do policy work like Liz was mentioning when I got back on. Um, to push these efforts forward on a legislative uh, you know, scale, both regionally, uh, statewide, and um, federally. And uh, we do a lot of mapping as well to help pinpoint where we should focus these connectivity efforts. Um, so hopefully I'm still here and everybody can still <laughs> see me. Good, good. And uh, I'm gonna throw it over to Steve um, to fill in uh, the exciting parts, uh, other parts of the research. We Get out of sharing my screen here. Thank you all for your patience. That was a bit of a nightmare to keep getting dropped off there. Tara, how are we looking here? Is the main slides up? I am seeing your slides. Yes, this looks great. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll get going here. Um, well, first off, Liz, awesome recovery. <laughs> I probably would have fainted um, with all that challenge. So great job. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Always got my back. <laughs> well, well, it's great, great to be here. And um, at NPCA, we advocate for national parks and outside of national parks on wildlife connectivity concerns. Today, I'm going to present on our mortality and camera research in the gorge, um, the component that Liz touched on a little bit. In addition to Liz, Liz's, Liz Hillard's awesome partnership, this research would not be possible without the vision and support of Jeff Hunter at NPCA and Ron Sutherland at Wildlands Network. 
and many other partners and generous private donors. My presentation will briefly highlight the Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Connectivity Collaborative and overall rationale for our work, uh, followed by an update on, on our study. This is in addition to the, the elk uh, GPS collar work that Liz gave great detail about. The Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Connectivity Project is a large collaborative that first met in February 2017 in Asheville. Later that year, stakeholders visited the Harmadin Bridge area as shown here. Over 25 non nonprofits and state and federal government agencies are currently involved, including Liz Rutledge and Tim Guestwicky of the Wildlife Federation. In fact, they were really early, early leaders in this effort. Um, and, uh, and they're exceptional partners in this work. The collaborative is growing stronger and currently we're experiencing, like Liz said, very strong momentum. This level of partnership is quite remarkable and we're expecting to reach some significant milestones in 2021. Our mission is to improve wildlife's ability to cross I-40 in the Pigeon River Gorge that will result in improved public safety. So why here? Why expend valuable conservation resources in this area? First, looking at a map of federally protected lands across the US, we see that compared to out west, there's a relatively small amount of federally protected lands in the east. And the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding national forest lands, uh, including Pisgah and Cherokee, make up a substantial portion of it. Here's a map produced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service administered Southeast Conservation Blueprint Project. It highlights the significance of the Smokies and surrounding national forest lands. This key habitat corridor is critical for the long-term flow of regional plants and animals, especially considering climate change. Ron Sutherland with Wildlands Network has done similar analyses and, and found pretty much the, the same thing. So very important area. Our research study area runs along I-40 from the Maggie Valley exit in North Carolina, 28 miles to the Foothill Parkway, Foothills Parkway in Tennessee. It's a two-year study, um, at least phase one, and that's ending this winter. Our target species are black bear, elk, and white-tailed deer, uh, but we're collecting data on many other species as well. We hope to have the analysis complete by the summer of this year, but we got a lot of data, so. Uh, we hope we can make that that uh, make that happen. Um, zooming in a little closer, the blue is the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Green are the national forest lands, and the stippled area is the Harmadin Black Bear Sanctuary. Um, and then the pink areas are the uh, conservation lands from the Southern Appalachians Highlands Conservancy. And uh, Tara, can you still hear me? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, it's never been this quiet before on a Zoom call, so I was just wondering if I was talking to myself. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so SAHC um, is also a phenomenal partner in, in this project. We're employing, as Liz said, a multifaceted research approach. In, in addition to the GPS uh, elk collar work, where objective one is assess wildlife road mortality, objective two assess wildlife activity within the forested highway right-of-way, and three, assess wildlife use of existing structures. These three measures together will guide our recommendation process to offer data-driven solutions to not only reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and improve public safety, but also improve wildlife connect connectivity across this nationally significant landscape. So for research objective one, assessing road mortality, um, this cub, along with its mother and sibling, were killed this past year, past September. This bull elk was hit near Waterville, eventually making its way down to the river where it had to be euthanized. He was born in Cataloochee Valley, captured and tagged as a two-day-old calf, and was one of several elk hit or killed over the last few years by vehicles. Prior to our study, anecdotal reports of large mortality years include 50 to 75 bears killed in 2011 on I-40 from the state line to exit 37, this according to a park biologist, and 129 bears killed in 2013 in Haywood County, according to NCDOT IMAP employees. Through data sharing with our partners at NCWRC, TDOT, and NCDOT, we've combined historic and current mortality data, including data from our weekly driving surveys, to develop a target species mortality hotspot map. 
And, and this was actually Liz's doing, so credit where credit's due. <laughs> and uh, here it is. Its value will increase as we continue to populate it with more data. We can also run finer tuned analyses that factor in between species differences and seasonal variations. Important to note that historically, mortality numbers have been underreported. Since intensifier survey efforts at the onset of this study, the reported annual mortality rate has increased sixfold. Uh, special thanks to Colleen Offenbuttel with NCWRC, Michelle Hunt and Jacob Ely with TDOT, and Marion Ferguson and Dade McHenry with NCDOT for sharing their data. For research objectives two and three, we've deployed 115 cameras, 47 at 21 structures and 68 along the Forested Highway right-of-way. Um, and those cameras have logged in over 70,000 trap days. We run them 24 to seven unless they're shot or stolen, which actually happens a fair amount. Uh, those cameras have logged in over 25,000 unique wildlife events, including 2,000 black bear, uh, 400 white-tailed deer, uh, 65 elk, 900 bobcat, and several observations of long-tailed weasels and spotted skunks. I should say these events, they're not necessarily individuals, but they're just, uh, uh, you know, observations. Um, again, a special thanks again to Colleen Offenbuttle and Justin McVeigh of NCWRC and Kim Delosier of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for loaning and funding uh, cameras. Since we're just now entering the data analysis phase, today I'm mostly just going to present camera photos with some really preliminary results sprinkled in. So for research objective three, assessing wildlife activity within the forested highway right-of-way. Um, the photo on the right is one of our cameras facing away from the highway. On the left is this consecutive series of photos taken from that same camera. This bear appears to void the highway at this time, and this is a stretch of highway that experiences a high level of bear mortality. Take-home point is that a row can sometimes serve as a barrier, other times as a mortality trap. Um, it's really a risk reward evaluation for food, food needs, breeding opportunities, et cetera, that black bears and other animals must make when traversing landscapes infused by roads. This sow and her cubs appear to be running up from the highway. Uh, take a note of the truck lights in the background. And here's what this site looks like during the day. This is the same site with several bucks descending down toward the highway. And here, uh, an elk and her calf are moving parallel to the highway. Our right-of-way cameras are placed usually within 40 meters of the highway. One of the biggest surprises to me after starting our research was the abundance and richness of wildlife observed so, so close to the highway. Here's a bobcat uh, checking out the camera. This is a beautiful set of photos. And we get a lot of those with bobcats. They're, they're quite curious. We've also observed several eastern spotted skunks and long-tailed weasels, both of which are species of concern. Other non-target species include red and gray foxes, otters and minks, flying squirrels, and many other species. Here a bear is seemingly evaluating the highway below. You can see the highway in the inset there. GPS collar research in Minnesota by Dittmer and all documented that bears' heart rates increase as they approach roads up to 200 meters away. Their research indicates that black that bears indeed perceive the risk associated with crossing roads, at least physiologically. And here's that same site with this bear actually standing and, and seemingly looking down right at the highway. Just a great, great shot. Here's some black bear observation data from our highway right-of-way cameras for summer and fall uh, 2019. In the 20 mile portion of North Carolina, we've observed about 9.4 times the number of bear events per camera along public protected lands compared to private lands highlighted here. But in contrast, some of our highest numbers of deer and elk have been observed along these, this same highlighted portion of private sections. Um, for research objective three, we're assessing wildlife use of 21 existing structures. None of them were constructed with wildlife in mind. Some are being used successfully to some degree by our target species, many are not. These include metal culverts, concrete culverts, creek, concrete creek culverts, <laughs> um, bridge underpasses, box culverts, 
river bridges, and the, the double tunnel. And here are some examples of use by wildlife. Here's a bear crossing through a box cover. He, he actually kind of goes in several times before gaining enough of the courage, enough courage to finally shoot out the other side there where we also have a camera. And, he, and Liz showed this one. Uh, here's an elk using that same structure. So this was a really exciting development. He actually was either on or right next to some conservation land that SAHC um, purchased. So that was really exciting. And here's a bear crossing under a river bridge. And you can see the river there in the inset where this camera's at. And, and this is one of the best ones. Here's a bobcat and kitten crossing under the highway. Note the tail signaling by the adult, likely indi indicating to its kitten that it's safe to proceed. Interestingly, the kitten was unable to navigate the structures seemingly just four days prior, likely due to the steep drop off there. Here, a bear successfully crosses under the highway, going in one side and out the other side. Although the prior examples are encouraging, many existing structures are lacking in terms of size, type, condition, and suitable location. Uh, this photo seems to depict the reluctance of a white-tailed deer to enter a culvert, which based on size and type really isn't suitable. Uh, she ultimately did not enter that structure. This bridge spanning uh, the Pigeon River closely tops the under underlying rock surface, essentially blocking movement for large mammals underneath. Otherwise, it could be an important um, structure. Because most culverts were developed for drainage, not wildlife, they have a good amount of water flow, which along with low light conditions deter use by most species. And you can see this buck wading in and just almost immediately turning around. I think he was in there like 20, 30 seconds, and he actually did this a couple of times. And you can see how dark that tunnel is from a daytime photo. So this is just preliminary data, and we still have actually a lot of data to enter, but this kind of gets at the point what the patterns we're seeing on the ground. This map highlights black bear observation at highway right-of-way sites in black and at structures in red in geographic order. Zeros were added to indicate no observations. Many observations at structures, the structures here, the ones that are getting wildlife, are really a, are often approaches and not necessarily successful crossings. For example, at this site, I just uh, put an arrow towards, while using the structure at times, animals appear often to divert, to divert from it, choosing instead to cross the highway at grade. So like a combination of both. So this kind of indicates to me, good placement, but maybe a suboptimal structure. Take home point is there are only a few structures that bears are crossing to using to cross I-40. And in most cases, even those are not ideal under current conditions. Looking at white-tailed deer and elk are similar, even fewer safe crossing opportunities seem to exist across the highway landscape, likely because of their more highly specialized requirements. For most other wildlife species, including small mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, I-40 is like an even greater barrier to movement. Through mortality observations, camera trapping, and Liz's elk GPS collar tracking, we're, going, we're gaining tremendous insight into where wildlife are attempting to cross, where activity levels are the highest, and the, perma, and the permeability of existing structures. Next steps for the collaborative include, like Liz had mentioned, um, continuing to work with NCDOT to improve wildlife passage under and around five upcoming bridge replacement areas. And also, once our data analysis is complete, we will also work with TDOT and NCDOT and a technical advisory team to make recommendations for new structures and or improvements to existing ones. New structures may include size appropriate culverts, wildlife underpasses, and even land bridges. Uh, these examples shown are from Canada and Washington State. And, uh, and th that's it, so thanks, thanks a lot for your time. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank Steve and Liz for their time today because I think nothing sums this up better than sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And so 
this data wouldn't be possible without the amazing field work that both of you are doing. And the Federation's very appreciative of that and the collaborative in general. But um, I'll make it quick and just say from the Federation standpoint, this is a priority for us going into 2021. And Steve mentioned, you know, there's room for great gains this year. And so that's something we're going to keep plugging away, keep working hard, and uh, we hope to have more information to bring back to you all in the future regarding this topic. And so we couldn't do it without all the collaborative partners involved. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate you guys tuning in today for the webinar. And so we think it's important to give you some time to ask your questions and get some feedback. So I'll turn it over to Tara and we'll start taking your questions. Great, and thank you all so much. I am so moved by all of those photos, and um, it's just truly amazing to see the bobcat photo, the bears, um, everything. So I've just really appreciated it, and I'm sure everyone else on the call has as well. So thank you, Liz, Liz, and Steve. Um, so if anyone, <laughs> so if anyone would like to ask um, some questions. We have, um, there's a little hand symbol in the top right hand corner of the screen and it says raise hand. So you can go ahead and click that and then we'll just call you in order of your question. We'll start with Patricia. You can just unmute yourself and then ask your question. And you can unmute yourself by clicking the little microphone button in the top right hand corner. It says mute and unmute. I'm sorry. Um, thank you. You are so fine. Much. Thank you for all that great information. And I I was wondering um, how much the state is participating as far as, you know, um, our taxes um, that we pay and, and, you know, some of that auto whenever I renew my tag. I wonder if that is being tapped into if auto tags can be a source of income and anyway it seems like it would be an automatic uh, uh, good way to raise funds but I don't know how that works but thank you. <laughs> Do you want me to take this one first Tara for a second and then we can yeah, see if it, Liz. Steve and Liz have anything to say but I, I would say thank you for your question Patricia because I think that's that's kind of the truck, the crux of where we're headed with this is that, um, first of all, what we're doing here is telling the narrative of the story through the data. And then it's our responsibility then to educate the public on what that means for wildlife, human safety. And so um, that's typically a driving force in some of this. And so we're going to be doing a lot of public outreach and advocating for these species through the scientific data. And that's where we hope to be headed to bring this to the forefront for transportation and different state departments for us to tell this story and to potentially say, hey, this is how much this costs. It's typically expensive upfront, but in the long run, it's well worth how much is invested in terms of um, vehicle wildlife collisions in terms of um, intrinsic value of wildlife, things like that. So hopefully in the future, that's where things will go. So we will definitely be uh, looking for advocates like you all to uh, help us further that mission for funding. Um, and I'll let Steve or Liz, if they have anything to offer. I think you really got at it there, <laughs> Liz. You know, um, currently, funds aren't being specifically allocated for for these wildlife crossings or mitigation but that is what we're pushing for and you know raising the red flag these are issues and hopefully um, in the future have allocated funds to to really you know work on these projects and have good outcomes and i think in north carolina it's especially critical too because um, we see our population numbers increasing and there's no sign of that slowing down and so the sooner we start mitigating some of these issues the better off we're all going to be in the future so um, for our state in particular it would be good you know to be one of those leading states especially in the southeast to address some of these issues so thank you for your question absolutely thank you we would look good if we did some of those things we would definitely be a beacon of hope thank you totally agree thank you 
I'll just uh, add to, to that, that at the regional level, not thinking about uh, funding, but the support of the DOTs and the interest has just really been great. And that's been one of the really highlights. So it's kind mm-hmm. of one of those things when you get everybody supporting in the sense that we think it's a good idea, I think you're in a better place to how do we make it happen. And I think we everybody's on board to a lot of, in, at least at the local regional level on that it's a good idea. And now just Liz, Liz, Liz Rutledge had made a point, you know, kind of long term increases in traffic. And right now that stretch of highway gets, a, I think, an average an, annual average daily traffic of 28,000. And so what happens is that once that starts increasing more and more, especially at night, what you'll start seeing is less wildlife probably will get killed because less wildlife will try to stop trying to cross. And to me, that's the biggest issue is when Mm -hmm. it becomes a complete barrier and thinking in advance now we we still have an opportunity to kind of reopen that up so thank you perfect thank you guys so much um we'll turn it over to john who has the next question you can just unmute yourself when you're ready yeah thank you i just had a, a quick question is there any data about the economic and human cost of all of these uh, wildlife uh, human interactions on our highways? I don't think there's those numbers specifically for North Carolina. I could be mistaken, but there have been published research by Marcel Hauser um, really identifying as far as vehicle cost of vehicle collisions, um, mm-hmm. insurance and things like that have been tallied. I, Steve could e- might even have some of those numbers on his head. Um, uh, I don't, but the, those studies have been done. And, and that's what I think Liz was kind of referencing that um, those costs are so extreme that that's another good point to put out there. And thank you for the question that like Liz mentioned, the cost saving over time, because they have went into, you know, as far as damage to vehicles or just insurance costs to people and things like that. Uh, the number figure on each wildlife vehicle collision is 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 very expensive and up there. Yeah, yeah I know in uh, years and years and years, Michigan kept pretty good track of that. And there would be 200,000 deer auto collisions a year. And it was costing the taxpayers and you know they they published that data in order to make people more aware so yeah i great will point. Oh, sorry liz nope i was just saying great point <laughs> i will add that ncdot has done a very good job of recording some of that data and i recently saw some estimates for damage that incorporated it wasn't broken down completely by species But deer were the large majority for North Carolina, but they're also black bear, other species in those numbers. But it's broken down by county from NCDOT. So you can actually look at your county and see deer vehicle collisions. Um, But I think what we're going to be bringing to this, too, is that uh, that's probably the species that most people think of when they think about vehicle collisions but there are a lot of different types that are occurring with elk and bear and a lot of smaller ones too. I mean, we see frogs, we see salamanders, we see rabbits, we see all kinds of animals trying to cross roadways, but there is some data out there. So if you wanna check out the DOT, NCDOT website, I think you can pick up some county data that way. Great, thanks. Is there anything you wanted to add, Steve, or is it all covered? Um, I think that they covered it great. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks for the question, John. Um, we'll turn it over to Sarah C. Hey, so sorry, my video camera, it's, it says it's like not supported by this. So sorry, you can't see my face. But um, I'm out of Caldwell County and I'm the extension agent. And I'm wondering if there's like a way for us to make, maybe partnerships, not a, the right word, but like to support or help get information out to educate if there's any room for that. I don't know if you guys want to answer, but from the Wildlife Federation standpoint, we're happy. (laughs) We're very (laughs) happy to take anybody who wants to partner and do outreach opportunities, especially on the local level, because we anticipate that that's what this is going to need from the mountains to the coast to support these species. And so we would be more than happy to um, 
further educate any local groups, provide the occasional speaker for things and get information to you all. So um, I believe our contact information is in the emails and you have Tara's email information. So we are always looking for folks like that, but I'm sure NC in National Parks Conservation Association and Wildlands probably is as well. So I'll let them uh, let you guys know what they have available. Yeah. Similar to what Liz said, this is going to be this collaborative effort to get the word out. Um, you know, Steve and I are wrapping up here and we'll have this great story and, and kind of way that we can move forward and focus on the gorge. But um, we would welcome, you know, getting as many folks on all kinds of levels involved. Uh, we don't have any specific rollouts here, but those are coming as as we finish it up. And um and Sarah, Sarah C. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and also, we have uh, quarterly um, conference calls that are pretty well attended, like 40, 50 people. Uh, and I think we even have a subcommittee on outreach. Like everything's kind of growing now. So I, I see that as another avenue. You might want to contact one of us and we can just send you the link to the next, when we have the next meeting, you can get on our stakeholder list and just become a, a part of it. Um, Absolutely, I would love that. Great. Okay. Great. We have one more question in the chat. Any corridor projects in the Piedmont? I'm in Charlotte. <laughs> Anyone can take this one. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in for just a second. And actually, both Liz's may know more than me. I'm not too familiar with any in the Piedmont, but the coastal plain. Uh, Colleen Offenbuttle and, and Travis Wilson are conducting road ecology research. In fact, they they were instrumental in getting three uh, underpasses, wildlife underpasses out there, but I'm not sure about the middle part of the state. How about you? Uh, I don't know of any Piedmont projects currently. I know Liz, do you? I'm trying to think as well, um, and I will say Charlotte's not too far from the mountains, so it's not. <laughs> yeah. That's right. um, but I'm trying to think, so there are some projects in various locations across the state that have been completed in the past, um, but I think as far as current projects, I can't think of, as they were saying, the Piedmont has fewer than the coast and the western part of the state, but I'm sure there are areas that are very deserving of more attention and more, more survey and things like that. And I'm sure some of our, our local Wildlife Federation chapters will be picking up more and more projects to help state agency folks look at, you know, numbers and be involved in projects. So we'll definitely continue to advertise um, opportunities for folks as they become available. Great. Yeah, I think that was a great question. Um, we'll turn to Steve Siegel next. Hi, this is Steve Siegel. I'm a biology professor at Appalachian State. And the question about the Piedmont, in particular the Charlotte region, is something I could speak to just a little mm. bit. Yes, please. Um, I've been doing some resistance surface modeling and things like that mainly interested in disease transmission, but they're vector-borne diseases, so it includes deer and things like that. So it's not an underpass or overpass type of project, but uh, it does involve the roads, certainly, and that sort of thing. So I'm not certain who the person from Charlotte was, but if they're if that is of interest to them, they could contact me, I'd be fine. Um, in terms of vector-borne diseases, uh, one of the things that I've been working with out here in Western North Carolina is the distribution of black-legged ticks, which is a species that carries Lyme disease, and sampling in Haywood County, actually, uh, near your site down there. So I was wondering whether you actually, when you're looking at these uh, road kills, are you actually examining for uh, uh, parasites and those sorts of things? You want me to answer that one? Yeah, I've been head handling more of the dead things. <laughs> um, well, we do, we actually, we don't collect any parasites. We, we've been collecting um, premolars for the, for the state, for their uh, population kind of uh, research. 
Uh, but that'd be something we open open to uh, if it's something that's easy to do and just collect and put in a vial. You can get in contact with us, and we can't always stop for wildlife uh, mortality when you know because of safety issues. <laughs> but we try, and uh, let's love to you know contribute to other research. So Steve, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Okay. Well, this whole question of of connectivity is important, obviously, for wildlife. So you guys are doing some really neat stuff. Uh, but it also is connectivity in terms of disease transmission as well and or lack of connectivity. And so it's something I've been interested in for some time now and something that I'd like to keep in touch about. That's great. Sounds great. Think, uh, this is how collaborative efforts are born right here. <laughs> That's so right. We appreciate you speaking up and feel free to reach out to us um, via email or anything and we can talk further about your interests and research that you're doing. We'd be extremely interested in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Interested in keeping in touch. Great. Thanks, Thank Steve. you all. We have a question from uh, Rebecca Ake. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. You can find the unmute button in the top right hand corner of the screen. It looks like a little microphone. Sorry. I wanted to thank everyone for a truly great presentation and just ask about the learning curve various species show in learning to use the underpasses or culverts or, or whatever. So that was my question. Yeah, that's a great question and an interesting one. I, you know, I don't, I don't think we have that totally flushed out, but you know, animals seem to need to be in that general area. You know, that that needs to be kind of in their home range um, to to be using these. And and like Steve showed that bobcat picture, there is some learning um, of young, and I do think um, behaviorally. Uh, animals that live within that corridor do understand and, and recognize where some of those crossing locations are. But at the same time, um, a lot of that information, if you do have a, a vehicle mortality event, is then lost. So I do think there's some learning. I, um, from working out on the interstate, uh, it is so loud, it, it gets my nervous system going. Um, and so you imagine it's this, I imagine it's a big monster out there that they're they're keying into, but um, obviously with the animals along the road and seeing the mortality, they're they're making these risks because they don't they aren't seeing these safe crossing locations. So how much that information is getting transmitted um, from certain species? It looks like it. We seem to see the same animals, so we can't completely confirm that using those um, structures, but. Uh, the that question is is an interesting one um but we do see in these other projects where animals are funneled with fencing you see a lot more animals uh, than using those structures so the funneling is kind of an important important part of those animals being able to find those safe passage crossings i think there's also a lot of a good bit of research out there um especially in the western part of the country and stuff about um, some of these crossing structures are could be considered more species specific. So depending on where you are in the country and what species you're looking at, um, it would determine whether an overpass is appropriate, an underpass, um, culverts, tunnels. So those, and even, even the size and shape and the amount of light, things like that are um, can be adapted to make them make animals more um, I guess, interested in utilizing them. So there is a lot of data out there about that too, if uh, folks are interested in pursuing that further regarding different species. Okay, well, thank you. Great, great show. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And, and I'll just add that and for like new, new, uh, new structures, I, I can't remember the exact research, but it seems uh, there's several research projects that have tested this and in five years kind of comes to mind. So you have this when you build a new structure, I think after five or four or five years, you start getting like a, you know, 100 percent compliance for animals. Like maybe they don't use it initially. They haven't found it. So 
yeah, there does seem to be learning. So once you put a new structure out there, you might not want to expect it right away to be helpful, um, but give it some time. And then also as far as the ability to learn, like uh, Liz, Liz uh, Hillard said, um, like that Bobcat, I mean, that's kind of the only structure, one of the only structures in the area, and they found it. So there's a lot of learning ability. And and then some of these culverts that they're using, they're not optimal, but they're using them because that's what they found. That's what they found. And then far as even when there are structures, if you don't have fencing, Colleen Offelbuttle, I love this quote. She's, uh, I don't love the, the result of it, but it's a great quote. It's, Dead bears don't have good memories. So similar to what Liz Hillard said, you know, if, if a bear gets hit, he's not going to be passing that information on. But if he's using a structure, probably will be passing that information on. So um, anyway, great, great question, Rebecca. Thank you, Steve. And did anyone have any more questions? Um, if you do have one last pending question, you can click the little hand button in the top right hand corner of the screen. We'll just give you another another few seconds. But this was an amazing talk today. Thank you so much, Liz, Liz and Steve. We have learned so much from you guys. We've had some great comments in the chat just saying thank you. Thanks for the great, great work. Um, if anyone does want to follow up on, on any of this, you can send us an email. If you don't have the emails of the three people who spoke today, you can email me, T-A-R-A at ncwf.org, Tara at ncwf.org, and I'll connect you with, with, with these three. Um, so thank you so much. Did um, any of the speakers have any last words they wanted to share, words of wisdom? Uh, just uh, th thank you so much, Tara and uh, Liz, Liz Rutledge um, for hosting this event. R really appreciate it. And it's great, great working with you guys, great partners. Yeah, I want to say that too. Thank you for being such great partners. Um, thank you all for tuning in and having such great questions. And um, yeah, really enjoyed being a part of this. Uh, and sorry again for my technical difficulties there, but uh, thank you all. This has been great. I want to say thanks to, <laughs> to our speakers and all of our collaborative partners and to our audience as well. And uh, Feel free to tell a friend, tell a family member what you learned about today and word of mouth is the best way to get things around. So yes. uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, just reach out to us directly. Thank you. Great, and we will send the video and slides over in the next week. So if you guys missed anything or wanted to go back to any of those great pictures and um, anything that will be coming over. So. We really appreciate it, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for joining us on the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you.